Our first speaker is Craig Sutton, who got his PhD under spots here yeah. from Michigan. Yeah. And uh, followed by postdocs at Penn is now has been at Dartmouth for quite a while. Um, and he is speaking on the generic properties of Laplace eigenfunctions in the presence of torus action. Okay. Oh. Well, thanks, uh, Ruth, and thanks to the organizers, the other organizers, uh, for the invitation to speak here. Um, yeah, I guess it's my first time at TCU, and it's been great. Um, first conference that started with a jazz concert and dinner. So thank you so much for all the music and all that. It was great. Um, so yeah, so right. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess, uh, genetic properties of plus eigenfunctions in the presence of torus actions. And I guess this is a uh, really a I guess some work that's um, inspired or that's building on um, sort of a seminal paper of Carol, uh, Karen Ullen back from 1976, um, which explores sort of generic properties of eigenfunctions. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is maybe like look at that, revisit that work, but now looking at it um, in the presence of group actions. And I guess before I get too much further into the talk, maybe we'll define who the we is. Um, Yes, and so the we um, is uh, Dan Cianci, um, who's a former graduate student of mine and now at uh, working at Geico. Um, and so then there's also Chris Judge and then Sam Lin, who's in the audience, and then, of course, me as one of the co-authors on, on this work. Um, so, right, so I guess, like I said, this is a um, a work that's uh, in the area of spectral geometry. So maybe we'll do, since we're not all spectral geometries here, I'll just uh, give a little bit of a background to kind of situate the problem a little bit. Um, I will tell, remind you or you know, show you, I guess, what, Car uh, what Karen Uhlenbeck did um, in her paper in 1976. And then basically we're gonna have sort of two questions that we're gonna sort of want to explore. Um, those are gonna be like looking at sort of like the multiplicity of eigenvalues and the presence of symmetry. And then we're gonna wanna study the nodal sets of nodal, um, nodal sets of, um, of eigenfunctions under symmetry. And then if there's a little bit of time, maybe I'll give you um, some ideas like how we actually go about proving uh, some of the things in, in our paper, okay? So, um, all right, so for us, I guess just to set the stage, um, throughout this talk, I'm always gonna be thinking about uh, closed manifolds, uh, connected closed manifolds. I'll let R, L of M be the space of CL, uh, Ramanian metrics on our space. Um, and then for any, Ramanian metric, we can associate to it as our usual uh, Laplace operator, um, just given by negative the divergence of the gradient. Um, and then we're going to let the spectrum of the manifold just be the sequence of eigenvalues of the Laplace operator, where we're taking into account uh, the multiplicities. Okay. Um, and then throughout, we'll usually denote uh, by phi sub k, the, uh, the kth eigen uh, function of the Laplace operator. So the Laplace applied to uh, phi sub k will be lambda k times phi sub k. And then throughout, we'll kind of let L2 of m sub lambda uh, denote this uh, lambda eigen space, okay? Um, so, right, so I guess this is um, one of these talks in spectral geometry, like, and so the inverse spectral problem, as many of you may know, is really just trying to understand I guess, the mutual influences um, that exist between the underlying geometry of the space and its spectrum. Um, and so, you know, some of you may know this is like the can you hear the shape of a drum problem. And so there are lots of numerous uh, examples and there are people in the audience who uh, contribute to that, like Ruth, um, of constructing examples of isospectral manifolds um, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this is gonna sort of not be a talk like that. I guess we're, Really, so we're really going to be looking at maybe, um, I guess this is like studying, like I said, these generic properties of, of eigenfunctions, um, but in the presence of symmetry. So, um, but just to sort of situate ourselves, like, you know, why might we want to think about uh, the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues? Well, of course, we know uh, from, you know, teaching our classes that, you know, we have the wave equation and, um, you know, I guess the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the uh, Laplace operator play prominently in figuring out what the solutions are to this. And this is where I guess sort of this interpretation of sort of like the can you give a shape of a drum comes from because essentially these eigenvalues are sort of the natural frequencies at which your membrane will naturally uh, resonate. Okay. So, all right, so that's maybe one uh, reason why one might you know study this. Um, another reason, if this thing will advance. Yeah. There, oh, it did, ah, okay. Is uh, I guess uh, looking at Schrodinger's equation. And so we know that that sort of governs uh, the motion of a free particle in a space. And I guess what we can see then is that the eigenfunctions of, um, of the Laplace operator actually give rise to probability measures 
on your space. And so the ways you think of this is that this measure here, mu sub phi, is kind of telling us, okay, what's the probability of finding a free particle um, in state, you know, in, in the set A. And then another thing that might be of interest to us later on the talk is just understanding that, okay, well, as you let the energy level go off to plus infinity, the idea is that, okay, one might expect that these measures start to kind of reflect some of the underlying dynamics of the classical system. So here, um, maybe thinking like the geodesic flow. So if your geodesic flow is ergodic, then one might sort of expect that in the high energy limit, um, that reflects itself in these measures by getting those to kind of equidistribute um, across the across the space and, and converge to the Leoville measure. So that will maybe come up a little bit in the second half of the talk. Um, okay. So some basic questions, I guess, in light of all this, um, one thing you might want to try to do is just, can you actually compute the spectrum of a manifold explicitly? And then to what degree can you actually nail down um, explicitly Laplace eigenfunctions? So I'll maybe walk through a few examples of where we can actually do this and then um, sort of get into, I guess, the actual um, meat of the matter. So, okay, so let's suppose we have like a, a torus. So we're just taking Rn and take your favorite full rank lattice inside Rn. Well, okay, you quotient out, we get a torus. And if we look at the dual lattice, which is just the set of all the elements, such that we pair them with everything inside gamma, you get a, get an integer. Well, okay, in that case, it's kind of easy to work out what the spectrum of the flat torus is. It just turns out to be given by four pi times the norm of the elements in your, in your dual lattice. And then your corresponding real false eigenfunctions are just given by cosines and sines. Okay. Um, and then here, the number of, um, I guess, the multiplicity, well, now you have your dual lattice sitting inside your space, and you basically just want to look at the number of lattice points that sit on a sphere of radius lambda, and that's going to be the multiplicity of that particular eigenvalue. Okay. So, all right, so that's the flat torus, and so there, everything's nice and explicit. Um, another example would be, let's say, the round sphere. Um, so here, um, we can then, let's say, let P sub K be our harmonic polynomials of degree K, and then uh, one can sort of check that essentially the Laplace eigenfunctions just turn out to be the restrictions of those harmonic uh, polynomials to your sphere. Um, and the, the ones of degree K correspond to this eigenvalue K times K plus N minus one. Um, and then the multiplicity of those is given by this formula over here. So once again, in this state, we can actually compute the spectrum explicitly, and I can actually write down an explicit uh, basis of eigenfunctions, okay? Um, you know, I guess more generally, okay, these are all examples of compact uh, symmetric spaces. And so in particular, let's suppose I'm looking at irreducible uh, symmetric spaces. Um, if I let G hat K be the space of irreducible representations that have non-trivial K fixed vectors in them, then it turns out, okay, at least in principle, this can all be carried out. Um, and so there um, you basically know that you can give um, the eigenvalues um, in terms of, I guess, a function of the highest weights of representations. And then your Laplace eigenfunctions are going to be what are known as your matrix coefficients of, of representations. And then one can also write down explicitly um, what, you know, the, uh, the multiplicity of a given um, eigenfunction um, eigenvalue actually is. So, okay, so the, those examples just to show, okay, there are cases where we can actually compute explicitly uh, the Laplace eigenvalues and spectrum. Um, but I guess, unfortunately, in general, um, one really can't pin down um, the spectrum of the manifold explicitly, uh, nor can you actually usually write down um, an explicit basis of eigenfunctions. Um, but I guess, nevertheless, what we might want to know is, okay, is there some way for us to understand um, the typical behavior of your eigenvalues and maybe the typical behavior of eigenfunctions, even if you don't really know what they are explicitly? And so this is maybe I guess, some of what uh, was going on in this work of uh, Karen Uhlenbeck that I was referring to at the, at the start. So um, to set that work up, um, let me give you a definition. So for a closed Riemannian manifold, uh, we'll say that a Ramani metric has simple Laplace spectrum if the eigenvalues all occur with multiplicity one. And so, and then here, just to clarify what I'm going to mean by generic, um, we'll say once again that, that a residual set is just a subset of your of a topological space. That's an intersection of open and dense sets, uh, open and dense set subsets of, of your topological space X. And we'll say that the property P is generic if it contains a residual set. Okay. So with that terminology um, in hand, uh, the result 
or is part of the result of Ulam Beck is the following. Um, so she takes a closed manifold of dimension at least two, um, and then for each integer greater than two, considers the space of, of CL metrics on that space. Um, and then the statement of the theorem is that you can find a residual set such that the following things are true. If G is in this re residual set, then the Laplace spectrum is simple. So i.e. the eigenvalues all occur with multiplicity one. And it turns out that zero is a regular value of any um, Laplace eigenfunction. So in particular, what that tells you is that this, this zero set is a hypersurface sitting inside uh, your manifold, at least uh, generically. Um, and OK, here I'll say we're just talking about the Laplace operator. But OK, it's a, it's a more general framework that allows you to think about second order elliptic operators. So like in particular, if you care about Schrodinger operators, you could say fix a Romanian metric and then just change the potential function on your space. And then what she's able to show in that paper is, that, OK, well, um, actually, there's a um, residual set of, of potentials for which the uh, Schrodinger operator actually has simple spectrum. Okay. All right. So, all right. So there are these two statements um, that we have um, in Google and Beck's paper. And uh, what we want to do is to kind of like explore um, each of these um, uh, separately. So first, I'm going to think about just this question about, OK, well, what can I say about the spectrum of the Laplace operator, but now where I assume that there's some symmetry. So a generic metric on our manifold is bumpy and has trivial isometry group, but now I'm going to be interested in, well, let's suppose you have some compact Lie group, which is acting on that space. What can you say about generic G invariant metrics under that setting, in that setting? Okay. So, um, all right, this is me just saying this again here. So that first statement is we have this uh, generic um, metric. Um, and eigenspaces are going to be one dimensional. Um, but if you think back to those examples that we did, all of those had symmetry and they all occurred with like really large multiplicity. Like in particular, like you look at the sphere that has really large multiplicities, the, the torus as you look, you know, has a really large multiplicities as well. And in general, um, any irreducible symmetric space or just any compact symmetric space in general is going to have eigenvalues with exceedingly large um, multiplicities. Um, and the reason for that is because they're symmetry involved. So I guess the next slide is what I want to sort of just show you is like, how is it that the symmetry is forcing multiplicities on you? And then what that's going to do is to sort of show is, okay, well, if we want to study this problem, we kind of have to think about the question then becomes, are eigenspaces generically irreducible representations? That's going to be sort of the analog of this problem in this setting. Okay. So, all right. So just to unpack that, so just remember, I have my diffeomorphism group um, well, we can let that act on my space of, let's say, L2 functions um, just by what's called like, the regular action. And so I just take a function phi and I compose it with phi inverse, and that gives me a nice uh, group action. Um, it turns out that um, this action gives you uh, a way of detecting whether a diffeomorphism is actually an isometry. So one can go through and prove that um, <clears throat> if you have this, uh, uh, if this action commutes with a Laplacian, that happens if and only if phi turns out to be an isometry of the metric. But at any rate, what this equation is showing us here, though, is that um, the eigenspaces have to be preserved under this action. So whenever I have a group G acting on the space, um, then the eigenspaces have to be a representation of that, um, of that group. So, um, okay, so that tells us, so if G is acting freely or we can remove the free um, bit there, um, just for now, um, these will always be um, uh, representations of our group G. Um, and so <clears throat> one thing to note here is that, um, if I have a group acting on a space M, well, then generally then these eigenspaces are going to occur with um, arbitrarily large multiplicities because of this result here of Donnelly, which says, okay, as long as your quotient space is at least of dimension one, then um, <clears throat> you're going to have eigenspaces of dimension at least two. And in the event that G is semi-simple, um, actually, you're going to have uh, representations or eigenspaces of arbitrarily large dimension showing up. So in this setting, the result of Ullman that can't be true because we have symmetries. You have to have, you're forced to have multiplicities, as we saw in these examples. So therefore, really, what we can all we can really hope for, as I said before, is that these have to be irreducible representations generically. So with that in mind, we'll just introduce some uh, notation or terminology, and I'll say if I have a compact lead group acting on a manifold, um, and um, 
and I take some G invariant metric, we'll say that that metric has G simple spectrum if each of its real Laplace eigenspaces is an irreducible representation. And so then, as I said a few minutes ago, the problem now becomes if I have a compact or compact Lie group or finite group acting freely and effectively on a closed manifold um, of dimension at least two, um, is a generic G invariant metric on N, does it have G simple spectrum? So that's what we'd like to um, understand. Okay, um, oops, that didn't, there we go. All right, so this problem um, has actually been explored uh, before. So in 89, uh, Zeldich looked at this in the setting of, let's say, uh, normal covering. So here, take some finite normal cover of topological space and assume uh, with a finite group G, and now make this assumption that the dimension of the manifold is greater than or equal to the largest degree of an irreducible representation of, of the group. So remember, since this group is finite, the, there's an um, upper bound on the dimensions of irreducible representations. Um, and so then under that setting, in, under that assumption, he's able to show that, okay, well, if I look at a generic G, in, uh, G invariant as the metric in our space, well, then it will actually have G simple spectrum. Um, and so, as far as I know, like, so this is now effectively just looking at a finite group acting on a space. So, this might not, this is still, I guess, like the state of the art uh, for finite groups. So this is sort of suggest, okay, this is not um, sort of a trivial problem because, all right, this has now been around for, I guess, it's a few decades since then, and we still don't know uh, too much more about that. Um, I guess um, this problem does also appear in uh, Yao's famous problem list from 93. Um, and I guess looking at the setting of, let's say, Lie groups, um, Dorothy Shu considered, let's say, take your favorite uh, compact Lie group and look at the space of left invariant metrics on that space. Okay, well, that's now a finite dimensional space of metrics. Well, then she shows, okay, well, comes up with a criteria for you to actually have G simple spectrum amongst left invariant metrics. And she's able to show that if your group is a product of SU2s or a product of S3s with um with a uh, with a torus, then for a generic left invariant metric on that space, you have G simple spectrum. But it's still open as to whether that's true generally for a compact lead group. Does so, um, K have to be bigger than or equal to one for that? Uh, no, because okay, it's already known. Yeah, so it, yeah, it's already known for the torus. Yeah, but if you take a generic, um, yeah, a flat torus, it has simple spectrum, right? Yeah, I should have, yeah, so, okay. T simple spectrum, right? Yeah, okay. Was there a question there? Or that was the same? Okay, no, no. okay, all right. Oh, just reaching for a drink. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Um, all right, and so then there's a result of Gomez Morocos, um, which kind of um uses some of the work of Schuth to show that you have, um, a, uh, uh, you have this uh, generic irreducibility of Laplace eigenspaces on sort of trivial SU2 bundles. And then uh, more recently, Jung and Zelda were able to show that if you're looking at, let's say, an S1, principal S1 bundle over a surface, and then you look among these, what are known as the Kaluza Klein metrics. So these are metrics. So you have this S1 bundle, you put an S1 invariant metric on it where the S1 fibers all have constant length. That's what's known as a Kaluza Klein metric. Then among those metrics, you can actually show um, that your space has a S1 simple spectrum. So um, then I guess the result uh, with Sianci, Judge, Lin, and Self um, is the following. So let's suppose you have a torus um, acting on, on, um, on the manifold freely. Um, and let's suppose the dimension of that space is greater than the dimension of your torus. Um, and then we're going to look at the space of CL, T invariant metrics on M. Uh, then for each L greater than the two, we can find a residual set in this space of metrics such that a metric has T simple spectrum. Okay. So this question, so this result here, then I guess answers this question in general in full if we're assuming that it's a free torus action. Um, I guess I'll just remark that. I sort of said, okay, so there's a way in which this question arises naturally uh, for geometers, but it's also something that turns out to be of interest to, to physicists as well. And so um, I guess these results and the results of, you know, Zeldich and Schuth and others are actually sort of a manifestation, mathematically uh, rigorous manifestation of sort of this belief in physics that if you have like a, a generic Hamiltonian, then the eigenspaces should, um, should be irreducible representations. And so for them, they kind of think, okay, when you, when you don't have that situation, then some level that that's some kind of accident 
that it's happening that you have um, eigenspaces that are not irreducible with respect to your group action. And then they go a little bit further and say, okay, well, maybe what's going on is that when you have these um, large spaces that are larger than the than they should be um, given by the geometric symmetries, that maybe there's some other symmetries, hidden symmetries, maybe ones that are coming from you know other symmetries of your Hamiltonian that are actually sort of giving uh, rise to these um, high multiplicities. Okay. So that's um, another way in which this. Uh, oh. Oh yeah, right. So yeah, so began yeah, so it's the intersection of countable intersection of open and dense sets, right? That's what I mean by yeah, residual, right? Okay, so um, some examples of this. So um, obviously, we can look at let's say odd-dimensional spheres. Those all admit uh, free S one actions uh, just by looking at the um, Hopf bundle. Um, and so therefore, what we see is okay for S one invariant metric on an odd-dimensional sphere. Generically, you're going to have S one simple spectrum. So that's maybe one class of examples of which this applies to. Um, another thing to note is that if I look at two-step uh, null manifolds, well, then it's the result of Calais and, and Stewart that, okay, two-step null manifold, your two-step null manifold, if and only if you're actually a uh, principal torus bundle over a torus. And so then in this case, what we'll see is that uh, for the T invariant metrics on a two-step null group, null manifold, um, that you actually get T simple Laplace spectrum. So there's just a few instances in which um, this theorem actually applies. All right. Okay. So that's a statement. That's the answer is to uh, sort of question one. Um, so now what I want to do is maybe then sort of look at this uh, second part of the problem, which is thinking about nodal domains and, um, and nodal sets. Okay. So, um, so just to remind you that Ullenbeck showed that um, generically um, that your level set, the zero set of an eigenfunction turns out uh, to be an N minus one dimensional um, hypercircle. hypercircle. It's so, okay. So these guys um, have names. So the zero set we actually really call the nodal set, and the complement of the nodal set is what's called um, its nodal domain. Um, all right, and these are all things I guess that we're accustomed to dealing with because many of you have probably seen, let's say, in some physics class or whatever, um, you may have looked at these Clodney plates. Okay, so this is the experiment where you take a plate, you sprinkle some sand over it, and then you excite that uh, uh, plate at a certain frequency, and you get these really nice um, patterns. Okay, and so I guess. Um, in the 18th um, and 19th century. This was, well, they didn't have uh, TikTok and all that kind of stuff. This, <laughs> this was actually entertainment. Um, and Claudine, I guess, made quite um, a career out of traveling around and showing these magical plates to people. Um, but okay, but this became an object of, of study, um, you know, uh, for, for in, um, in the mathematics and, and physics community. So here, these patterns, this white part here, this is exactly where the function, your item function is equal to zero. Okay. All right, so then one might want to ask questions about, okay, what are these sets? Can we say anything about them um, generally? What can we say about them for, for generic um, uh, functions? Okay, so here's just an example, let's say on the two sphere, um, we're looking at um, nodal sets um, here. And I guess on the left, we'll just see that you're sort of going up in, in degree. And as you go up, it looks like you're sort of getting more and more of these um, uh, nodal sets. All right. Um, so a question might be, all right, well, how many nodal domains can an eigenfunction actually have? Okay. So um, the first thing to know is okay, that as long as you're a non-constant eigenfunction, you have to have at least two um, nodal domains. All right, okay, so this might be one of the few things that we proved today, but okay, but that just comes <laughs> from back. <laughs> yeah, and so this is, we can do this, we can understand this. Um, so we have a phi, well, it has to be orthogonal to constant functions. So that tells you now that the integral of phi over your set has to be equal to zero, but phi was presumed to be a non-constant eigenfunction. So therefore it had to be plus and negative someplace in order for this to balance out. So okay, so there have to be at least two nodal domains um, in this set. All right, so that's a nice lower bound. Um, you know, so okay, that didn't take all that much uh, work. Um, so, but then on the other side, you might say, okay, well, is there some kind of like, you know, speed limit on like how many you can have. All right. And so this is maybe a little more uh, non trivial. And so um, it's a theorem of Courant. Um, and then I guess for surfaces and then later generalized by Shank in uh, 76, which basically says, okay, if I have um, my secret orthonormal basis for eigenfunction, then the k eigenfunctions, the number, number of nodal, nodal domains for the k eigenfunction is bounded above by k plus one. Okay. So you can't have any more than k plus one um, uh, 
nodal domains for, for your eigenfunctions. So I guess I'll introduce this notation here, or these uh, terminology in the, uh, with the proviso that this is not, with the exception of the notion of current sharp, um, you will not find any of these other terms in, in the literature, but I'm just saying this just because I don't want to have to keep repeating uh, what I mean by this. Um, so, um, so anyway, we'll say that a sequence of, of the eigenvalue is current sharp if it has an eigenfunction for which it actually achieves this upper bound of k plus one. Okay. Um, and then I'll just say that a, a sequence of eigenfunctions is current if this nodal count goes off to plus infinity. Um, I'll say that it's nodally minimal, minimal if it's equal to two, which is the lowest, the fewest you can have. And then we'll just say more generally, it's nodally bounded if there's some number which bounds the sequence, okay, as you're going off, off to plus infinity. All right. Um, so I guess a few questions, if I have this rem uh, closed Ramani manifold, one might be interested in, I guess, the degree to which one can actually find current sharp eigenfunction, eigenvalues, um, a sequence of eigenfunctions, which is current, i.e. where this nodal count is going off of plus infinity. Um, is it possible to find them where you actually sequences where you have this nodal minimal, where it's always equal to two? Um, and I guess what we're also interested in is maybe the degree to which the geometry and the dynamics of the space is maybe sort of influencing the um, um, answers to these to these questions. Okay. All right. So I guess one result along these lines is by Pleyel, um, and so uh, this basically shows that okay, you can't have too many um, current sharp eigenfunctions. In fact, you can only have a finite uh, number of current sharp um, eigenfunctions. So, so that's kind of a rare thing to, to achieve. Um, I guess we, regarding this lower bound, um, it's actually been known for a while that you can actually construct sequences of eigenfunctions where you actually only have um, two nodal domains as you go up to plus infinity. Um, and so that sort of basically shows like okay, you can't really improve generally this lower bound of two, right? But there might be situations in which um, you can say something. But let me just look a little bit closer at this example of the two sphere and explain a little bit better what's going on there. So um, Levy in 77 constructed sort of this explicit uh, sequence of spherical harmonics of degree J and it has the prop property that when it's a spherical harmonic of even degree, um, you have three nodal domains. And when it's a spherical harmonic of odd degree, you have two. Um, and then basically you, you can show this sequence of functions forms a density zero um, subspace of your space of eigenfunctions. So by that, I basically just mean this expression here. If I have a subspace, I'll say that it's by a density. It's just by given, by looking at the dimension of the intersection of D with the sum of the eigenspaces up to level X and then dividing by the dimension of uh, that sum. And so, um, so basically this is showing you what well, you can't actually get any non-trivial lower bounds. And, um, <clears throat> and in fact, if one can find an only minimal sequence, like, then it's gonna span this density zero um, um, subspace. However, I guess in the other direction, just looking at the, um, the sphere, um, it's a result of Nazareth and Sodin. So although you can't, you'll have these sequences where you only have two uh, nodal domains. Um, it's also the case though that if I look at a typical eigenfunction though, that one should expect that the nodal, number of nodal domains is actually increasing. And so that kind of goes back to that picture before we had the spheres and we had the ones of degree 40 and I had the one of degree 100 and it looked over a lot more. So this result of Sodin and Nazareth is kind of saying, okay, well, that's the typical behavior. Um, so here, the formal statements, I'm just looking at some uh, Gaussian spherical harmonic degree K, and we're just showing this quantity and the nodal count divided by K squared um, sort of exponentially concentrates around the sum constant C, right? And that's basically showing, okay, well then typically we'd expect to get lots of nodal domains. Um, okay, some I'm other confused. things. Oh, and, sure. This is the max K plus one though, and then if you take the ratio three goes zero, Oh, no, so this is saying that, um, wait, that, that, that N and F over K squared X goes to, converges to a constant? It's saying that this quotient here is, yeah, concentrating around this constant C, 
right? right. But, but isn't the highest n of f can be k plus one? Let's see what's going on. What happens if this one would just be the degree and then they would be. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, right. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. yeah. That's thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. For <laughs> my answer. Okay. So, okay. Um, all right. So, I guess another result um, to think about is this result of Bloom, Nitzman, and Stolensky, which says, okay, well, in dimension two, um, one might want to look at the distribution of the nodal count. And so here they're kind of playing around this idea as well to what degree can nodal domains um, say something about the underlying dynamics. And so this is a question that's maybe coming from the area of quantum chaos, where what you're really looking for are ways in which um, this idea of the Bohr's correspondence principle that, okay, in the high energy limit, that your eigenfunction should somehow be reflecting some of the underlying classical dynamics. So here they're sort of positing that, okay, well, if I look at the uh, statistics of this nodal count, that there might be a way of sort of like distinguishing between integrable geodesic flows and ergodic geodesic flows, which for those of you who think about those things, okay, kind of like at the opposite ends of, of the universe in terms of, uh, of dynamics. And so there's this conjecture, at least for the case of surfaces, um, that one should expect that um, if you have your got a GDS flow, that this quantity here is um, sort of converging to this uh, number, which, okay, I don't know that really has any um, real uh, geometric significance. It just sort of just is what comes out uh, from their from their statistical experiments that they've, that they've done. Um, okay, so some, I guess, other results along these lines. Um, there's a result of Jung and Zeldich from 2016, which shows, okay, if I'm looking at Riemann surfaces of genus at least two, and suppose that we have this uh, anti-holomorphic involution where the fixed point set actually splits your space into these two components, uh, then they're able to show that in the space of, um, that there's a, um, for a generic sigma invariant metric, then every orthonormal basis sort of contains a current subsequence. So every orthonormal basis contains a sequence of eigenfunctions, which is flying off, um, for which the nodal count uh, goes off to plus infinity. And that, uh, sub those, that sequence spans a density one subspace. And then there's a similar result um, here by Zhang and Zhong, um, which I guess is under this uh, um, assumption of quantum periodicity, but I'll just throw it out there for the people in the audience who know about that. Um, okay, so um, what about, so all the results there, or many of the results that we just stated were ones that are happening in dimension three. Um, and so one might, I'm sorry, dimension two. And so one might wonder, well, what can you say about manifolds of higher dimension? Um, and then also what can one say about spaces that don't have ergodic or chaotic uh, geodesic flow? So the previous slides, that was all stuff that kind of heavily re relies on the fact that you have ergodicity. Um, so here's another result. So let's, uh, let's uh, a torus act on our space uh, freely. Um, and let's let B be the quotient. So then um, the first thing is, well, if the dimension of this quotient is at least one, we can find a residual set um, where for any uh, metric inside there, we'll have that the, um, that the nodal set is actually a smooth hypersurface. Okay, so this is just kind of a, a generalization of, of um, Ullenbeck's result, um, straightforward. Um, but now I guess if we assume that the space is of dimension at least two, um, then, okay, under some conditions, they forget about all this stuff. I mean, the main, the upshot here is that we can actually show that there's um, generically, you can find a um, sequence of eigenfunctions which, for which the neural count is always exactly two, and that spans a subspace of vital density one. So in this case, it's kind of exactly the opposite extreme of what we were seeing in these examples where you had um, chaotic geodesic flow. So and then Schultz here, if you have this S1 or, or a torus action on a space, you can't have ergodic geodesic flow. Okay. So here you get sort of like the, the, the opposite uh, behavior. Um, and well, maybe we'll skip that part there and just say, okay, well, so then essentially a corollary of this is that um, if you have a, a space where your uh, homology does not contain any um, elements of, of a finite order, um, and then suppose that M is a total space of an S1 uh, bundle over this space, then you can show that for a generic S1 invariant metric on M, um, you'll have um, a lot of eigenfunctions that have exactly two nodal domains. So this idea of having um, this uh, minimal nodal count um, seems to be quite pervasive uh, for this example of, of manifolds. So um, maybe I'll do um, this kind of 
Well, okay, here's once again going back to our example of pop bundles. Um, one can see that in this case, we also get lots of examples of, of um, eigenfunctions where your nodal count um, is exactly two. And as the theorem says, they are going to span this density one subspace. So, in some sense, that is like the typical thing that's happening uh, for eigenfunctions um, in, that, in that space. Okay, so just a few remarks then, I guess, about the results. So I guess our first result, um, I guess, generalizes this result of Jung and Zeldich. So Jung and Zeldich were just interested in S1 uh, bundles over surfaces. Um, and so we're now looking at torus, free torus actions on any manifold. Um, and so I guess in the case of a torus acting freely, this completely answers um, problem 42 on, on Yao's list. Um, I guess along with the results of Jung and Zeldich, um, these are really like, so what I should say is like, so we, I gave you these other examples from let's say 1927 and 1970s of these um, sequences where you had exactly two nodal domains, but the point is that you didn't have very many of them um, because they just span a vial uh, sequence, a uh, vial subspace of density zero. Um, so, but this kind of gives you uh, sort of a very robust way of producing examples of eigenfunctions that have that have this property, and in particular, sort of showing you that David, in some cases, this is really the typical behavior. Um, and in some sense, this is like as I said, this is what's going on in the quantum inequality uh, community is this idea that maybe somehow ergodicity um, is what's kind of like accounting for high nodal domain counts, um, and this at least is somewhat consistent with that idea because these are not um, manifolds with ergodic geodesic flow. So maybe what I'll do then, I guess, in the remaining uh, few minutes is just sort of try to uh, give you a, a, a sense of how some of this uh, is proven. Um, and so in terms, I guess I will uh, talk about our generic irreducibility result and just sort of sketch um, what's what goes into proving this. Okay, so I guess the idea, once again, is that we have a torus um, which is acting on our space, and we're assuming that it's acting freely. Um, and I guess the first thing to remember is that essentially, um, you know, our irreducible representations with torus are just um, given indexed by in d tuples of, of integers. Okay, so give me any d tuples of integers, and that just gives me a representation where I send theta to this rotation um, inside um, SO2. Um, okay, so we'll let um, our the corresponding irreducible representations just be denoted by tau alpha. Uh, B alpha. And I'm now going to like fix a subset of the integers with the following property that um, F intersect negative F is actually equal to zero. And then um, F union negative F actually gives you all of the integers. So because I'm looking at a Z2 action and just quoting that and just looking at, um, you know, uh, coset uh, representatives. Um, okay. So then as we said before, we know that the torus acts um, naturally on the space via the regular regular representation. So I'm just letting, um, I have a torus element and I'm just letting act by theta inverse on X and then applying my function to it. So then what we can do is we can decompose our space into what are called isotypical components. And so we have our um, Sobolev space, or if you don't like that, you just say, just think of L2 of M. And I'm decomposing that into um, these isotopical components where this is uh, generated by all the copies of this representation that sit inside this uh, Sobolev space. So it's the smallest space containing all of those, uh, all of those guys. Right? Um, so then um, what we'll notice then is that basically the Laplace operator preserves these isotopical components. And so if I start with a, a G invariant, um, a T invariant metric, well then remember that, okay, we get this sort of commuting of, of the actions here. And since the Laplace operator commutes with this action, it tells you, okay, well, it's gonna leave these isotypical components fixed. So therefore I can now just think of the Laplace operator and restrict it to this isotypical component and just think about the spectrum on an isotypical component. So pick your favorite um, irreducible representation of your torus, look at the isotypical component, the Laplace operator is now a self-adjoint operator on that subspace, and it has discrete spectrum. And that spectrum is now a subset of the spectrum of the entire um, Laplace operator. Okay, so we can now decompose our L2 space into these, into these, into these pieces here. Um, and so what this then starts to show is, okay, you can start to see, if you wanted to prove this, 
um, that you maybe have a strategy. Since the spectra break up into these nice pieces, maybe what you would want to do is if I had two, two metrics, what I want to show is that, okay, well, at least generically, if I have um, <clears throat> that on isotypical components, different isotypical components can't have any spectrum in common. That might be the first part. And then the next part might be to show that if I'm restricted to an isotypical component, that then the um, eigenvalues there, the eigenspaces are just irreducible representations. Okay. So this is what's on the next uh, slide. So we'll say that part one is showing that we want to show generic spectral separation of isotypical components. So i.e. we have a residual set where for any metric inside y1, if alpha and beta kind of represent different representations, then the corresponding Laplace operators can have no eigenvalues in common. And in generic T-simple spectrum, there's a residual set where for any metric in there, if I look at um, the Laplace operator restricted to that isotypical component, I'm going to have T-simple spectrum. And then intersecting these sets, you would now actually get the result. So this is sort of the outline of what we, what we would like um, to prove. Um, so I guess one thing to note is that if we had a metric with T-simple spectrum, um, then we would actually be able to prove that we already have um, generic um, T-simplicity. And I'll just maybe sort of show, I guess, roughly what you might do, because this in some level shows some of the pieces that need to go into the general proof. But um, the point is, okay, with a big disclaimer, like I said, if we knew we had a metric with this property, this is what you could do. But the point is, it'll say here at the beginning, okay, we don't know how to actually explicitly construct metrics like this. But if you had one, um, then okay, the proof would be kind of uh, sort of uh, straightforward um, that you would take um, two representations, alpha and beta, um, and then look at this space where I'm, I'm looking at the uh, um, how the spectra agree up to, let's say, eigenvalue uh, level lambda. And so I want to look at the set of all metrics for which, okay, up to lambda, they have no eigenvalues in common. So the point is that that space one can show is actually an open set for any value of lambda. Okay? You don't need the existence of this metric G0 um, to prove that. Um, but to show that this thing is actually a dense set inside there, okay, we do actually sort of leverage the existence of a metric like this. And so then the point is going to be show that this guy is open, show that this guy is dense, and then just take this intersection over all these ends, and that would actually give you your res the residual set that you're after. And then to sort of prove this business about the simplicity on isotopical components, one would just use businesses about um, analyticity of eigenbranches and things of that nature. Um, but like I was saying, um, actually, we don't know how to do that. Um, I can't hand you one and say, okay, here's this generic metric. So we have to kind of like find a different tool. Um, and so basically now this is where I guess we start using uh, perturbation. So we'll look at our space of T invariant metrics on our manifold. And the thing to note is that um, this space is naturally in bijection with the space of smooth metrics on your base space. Um, you're, you can now look in fiber direction. And this is basically just a way of getting metrics along fiber. And this here is kind of like telling you your horizontal space. Okay, so you have a choice of what's happening on the base, what's happening in the fiber, and then I have to pick my horizontal space for this. And so that kind of tells us that we have like at least three different types of perturbations that we can appeal to in trying to, uh, to prove this result. Um, so then the next thing to observe is that it's sort of advantageous to change our point of view. So at first we're looking at um, scalar valued eigenfunctions, um, but what we're proposing here is that you, it's better to think about vector valued eigenfunctions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at um, functions. So we have a representation alpha of our torus. I'm gonna look at functions that take values in that representation. Okay. Um, and so then essentially the idea is that one can then go through and prove that um, looking at the space of, vec of um, vector value um, HK functions on M, okay, well, that turns out to be equivalent to looking at the space of scalar value functions. Okay. So we can now just transfer our problem to looking at this other operator, delta G alpha tilde, which is just the Laplace operator acting on, on these components here. 
Okay, so then um, once we do this, then, okay, well, this now changes our strategy. And so what we would like to show is basically the same thing, but now for these for this new uh, vector value, uh, Laplacian on vector value functions. Um, and so maybe I'll just say, like, I guess just to get a general sense of like what, what's going on here uh, for people, I guess, who like to think about um, representations of the groups and things like that, is that um, the reason for this switch is that the symmetry and the type of representation are kind of like forcing some multiplicities on you already. And so the thing to note here is that for a uh, for a torus, all representations are of com are, are of complex type. And so that means that you have a complex structure on, on your vector space. And so if I have an eigenfunction u for this operator delta g alpha, then applying the complex structure to that gives me another eigenfunction for free, which has to be linearly independent from that first one. And so, um, so what I'll say is um, this strategy, that, so at this point, really nothing I've said is like sort of special to the fact that I'm dealing with, with tori. You could actually now at this point be thinking about general compact Lie groups, but there you're going to actually have different types of representations. You'll have real type, complex type, and quaternionic type. And each of those is going to force certain types of multiplicities because of the structure. So real type, basically that's exactly like Uhlenbeck. Um, you have an eigenfunction, there's nothing that's being forced on you. Complex type representations, if I have one, I have to have two. And then for quaternionic type, if I have one, I have to have four because of the quaternionic uh, structure. So, um, so in the end, basically the idea um, is to uh, look at the following. Uh, so there's this framework of Uhlenbeck, and what we'd like to do is to look at this function, which takes um, these vector value uh, functions uh, across R2 and you map into our uh, uh, Sobolev space, space using this, this uh, function here. And the idea is that basically we have this characterization. What we want to show is that this kernel is generically two. And then the point is that basically we can turn that into this statement about the derivative of this map. Okay. And so it turns out that having eigenvalues of multiplicity two is equivalent to the derivative of this map uh, being surjective. And what I'll say then, I guess, um, in the last minute or so is that um, essentially what one ends up doing is like proving a version of parametric uh, transversality, which uh, gives us a way of generating um, of, of generating sets of, 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 of metrics which actually satisfy this, uh, this condition. And finally, um, once we have uh, generic T simplicity on these isotopical components, um, then we can sort of just move through and take our intersections over all the sets and get um, the result that, that we're after. So, I mean, that's um, sort of, I guess, the sketch of what goes into this. Um, but like I said, I guess sort of like the idea of like what needs to happen is in this case where you just assume that you actually already have one, but the sort of, I guess, the, the work is that, okay, you don't have one. And so that's where you need to kind of like do this uh, sort of more general version of, uh, of the uh, parametric transversality trick that um, Uhlenbeck employs. Um, and so then we get this result. So, okay, so that's sort of the sketch of that argument. And maybe that's, yeah, we're coming on 10 up. So I will stop there. So thank you. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, what part of the argument did you really need um, free actions versus, uh, because oh, it yeah. looked like a, most of the stuff I saw, it, it seems like it worked in general, but. Right. So, okay. Yeah. So actually um, we think, I don't know. Well, yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> so yeah, we think we can actually uh, remove all, all of this stuff. So I, I didn't want to talk about it today, but uh, yeah, we can um, show that you can remove. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. That assumption. So yeah. that was, uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I was, I, yeah. So um, it seemed like you were mainly looking at real representations uh, because like, <laughs> yeah, because it's, yeah. It's not true if you look at complex representations. Right. Yes. Then you have one dimensional ones to the right. Yeah. So yes, yeah. so you can't yeah um do it there. So we have to look at the real um real real valued eigenfunctions. This yeah probably only makes sense there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. There's something about the sum of the real 
Oh, so like understanding generic properties of, of the sums? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I have not thought about that at all. So, um, but, sounds like kind of determining those kind of uh, based on matrix. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe there's something to that, but yeah, I, I don't know any like results like along these lines like that. Looking at sort of like what's the generic properties of sums of these eigenvalues, yeah, but maybe that's something to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 